Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this first uh, installment <clears throat> in the series on joy and resilience. Um, I'm William Guthrie, and I'll be presenting this afternoon. So before we start, I just wanted to uh, um, start with a word of prayer. So if you'd bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, bringing us all here, for the blessing this conference has been so far, for the messages we've heard, for your spirits moving on our hearts. And we just pray that you would be with our time here this afternoon, that you'd send your Holy Spirit to be here with us, and that we would all gain a blessing and come away more motivated, with more desire to seek you and to minister to our patients. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a few objectives for this. My title for this presentation is Tuning Forks, Are You in Tune? And you'll just have to listen as we go through to kind of hear where that, title, where that comes through. Our objectives, understand how our spiritual intonation affects connection with patients. See how God desires to utilize your medical practice to minister to patients. And thirdly, discover practical methods for sharing Christ in the clinical setting. So I hope that through this, the presentation this afternoon, you can kind of glean some things that meet those objectives. Um, I've been blessed so far by the messages. How many of you have been blessed? Specifically the message last night, and both of them this morning were, were very good. Um, just focusing on our need for attunement with patients, our need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, and how he desires to truly work through us to minister to the needs of those around, around us. Sorry. You're starting early, aren't you? Yeah, I don't have any presentation, oh, though. You so. don't? You just no, gotta speak I'm just going to speak. Yep. Okay. Yep. Right. <laughs> Thank you, though. Appreciate it. How many of you have had something that's ministered to you out of those presentations? Amen. Amen. These conferences have been an encouragement to me for a long time, both before my training and all the way through. I can think back over probably 15 years ago to when these conferences began in Cajada Springs, Georgia, and just the blessing they've been. For those of you who don't know me, I recently graduated from Loma Linda's Family Medicine Residency, and I'm just in the infancy of my career, the baby doctor, you might say. And in light of that, the analogies here will likely include a fair share uh, from my residency. So please bear with me, and maybe. You can relive some of your residency days, or if you're in training, you may relate directly to some of the analogies. Since transitioning to life outside of residency, I frequently call to mind the various attendings who taught me along the way. I don't know if you find yourself doing that. In various patient encounters, I'll remember their specific lessons for managing maybe cirrhosis or how to approach the management of an asthmatic and exacerbation. But there's a difference. Now there isn't someone changing my treatment plan or giving immediate feedback on my performance. Suddenly, not only are patients looking to me for answers, but sometimes other providers, nurse practitioners, PAs, physicians will ask me for my recommendation on a certain condition. Maybe a specialist will be like, you should know, you know about this diabetes. And, and that's a new experience for me. But we're all designed to grow, right? Are there any pediatricians? No? OK, I was hoping maybe we'd get some. But we're all designed to grow, and a pediatrician would know that. And family medicine, too. We, we deal with that. This change of pace has provided lots of opportunities for growth, and these changes are highlighting to me how God desires to guide my practice in a more profound way. It's not limited simply to seeing patients and their clinical diagnosis and treatment, but I believe God wants to guide our lives in general in ways that we haven't imagined. How many of you desire deeper connection with the great physician? Amen. Amen. So as I finish up this residency season of life, I've been more and more impressed with my dependency on the great physician to guide my medical decision making, as well as my interaction with patients. Part of this, I'm sure, stems from what, we talk, what I just talked about, the transition from resident to attending and that kind of being on my own. But I truly sense that God is desirous of a deeper connection and walk with him in, regardless of, of those external factors. And how does he propose to do this? I'm impressed that as I've transitioned out, I don't need to lose that sense of having an attending there, someone else to, to guide me. God wants to be the guide for my practice. He wants to be there in a very real way. We have the greatest attending physician, right? His career has spanned eternity, and his experience is beyond any we can imagine. We are called to bless the Lord with our soul. 
And at Psalm 103, verse 3, um, it gives him an attribute. He heals how many of our diseases? This great physician, he heals all of our diseases. Who here can claim to heal all diseases? No, right? We're just finite physicians. We don't, we don't know that. I definitely can't lay claim to any, anything like that. So through the Holy Spirit, he desires to minister through us in our practice and actively guide our decisions, our conversations, and to bring true satisfaction in our lives and healing to our patients. Only when we can recognize the true physician working can we hope to see true healing for our patients. And today I want to focus on that source of joy and resilience that's helped keep me focused throughout the pressures of training. And I hope that this time can serve to encourage each of us as we seek to experience more of the indwelling Christ in our practice, in our ministry, and in our lives. So taking a moment to look back, reflect on the theme for this series, and specifically on the idea of resilience. What is resilience? Anybody have any? any? Yeah, the ability to get back up. Very good. You could define it in many different ways. We could take a long time to do that. But the counterpart to resilience has become somewhat of a hot topic for physicians in training and among physicians in general recently. That's the idea of burnout. How many of you have heard of burnout? Hey, heard that word recently? What are people saying about this subject? So I kind of looked through literature a little bit, and the Academy of Family Physicians has a journal, journal article series by Dr. Drummond from 2015, and he, lists, he starts with listing some of the undesirable consequences of burnout, from lower patient satisfaction and care quality to higher medical error and malpractice risk. We have higher physician and staff turnover, physician alcohol and drug abuse and addiction, and worst of all, as has already been mentioned today, physician suicide. He describes burnout in terms of drainage of our three energy accounts, our physical, emotional, and spiritual energy counts, accounts. I thought that was a useful way of looking at the subject of burnout. And what are the causes of burnout? He talks about five main causes of burnout. So the first, practicing clinical medicine, which would include like the burden of disease. You, we all can relate to that. Maybe it's your specific job, secondly the context of that job and the challenges there. Having a life outside of work, which initially said, well, isn't that what everybody wants is a life outside of work? But maybe the stressors outside of work, maybe life outside of work isn't always giving us what we need to, to give at work. Um, maybe, con maybe it's the conditioning from our medical education. Fourthly, he brings that up. Have we been conditioned to practice in such a way that it's not sustainable, it's not tenable? And then maybe the immediate supervisor leadership style, which could relate to any job, really. But um, that also applies to medicine. Can you identify any of these areas that, areas that may be affecting your well-being, your resilience, your, your joy? In a negative or positive way, I guess we could say. <laughs> Just last month, the AMA and the New York Times featured articles highlighting how, with the pandemic, there's been a concomitant dramatic rise in physician burnout up to 63% among survey respondents from the Mayo Clinic, Stanford University School of Medicine, and the U University of Colorado School of Medicine. This is a real issue that we have in medicine. And what about solutions? Well, most of the solutions postulated by the authors of these articles center around political policy change or instituting programs for physicians to address their practical concerns surrounding burnout. But those seemed a bit empty when we think about the political realm these days, wouldn't you say? Like, how many answers are we getting from the political realm? Dr. Drummond, in his article series, suggests some practical strategies that might be useful. Maybe we could improve our documentation efficiency and use of the EMR to become more efficient, right? We always want to do that. Dot phrases and, you know, templates and all of the flow. Um, maybe have physician extenders uh, or use the EMR or, or scribes to make the burden of documentation easier to handle. These can be helpful, practical ways to reduce the logistical burdens involved in any practice. But it come, brings us back to the question, what is burnout? And I know we talked about the drainage of the energy accounts, but he, post, he postulates this, or he gives this hypothesis that burnout really isn't a problem that can be met with a solution in a, in a real way. It's more of a dilemma that we face. And to, when we face dilemmas, um, we need sustainable kind of practices and, 
and strategies that we can implement to guide us through the challenges of caring for patients in the long term. It's not a one and done, like, plug the hole and, and, and the drainage stops. So in our quest for a sustainable answer to maintaining resilience, we might consider, we might do well to consider the questions we ask our patients when probing their spiritual framework. And I really appreciated some of those questions in the last presentation that we, that we had. I don't have all of those here, but if you took some of those with you, um, very good, I took some pictures of them myself. But questions like, where do we find our hope and strength from? Where do we obtain that? We, we're asking our patients that, but can we reflect it back on ourselves? When we have a problem, where do we turn to for answers? You know, and, and there could be so many other questions. And this brings us back to the focus for this talk. We need to be in tune with the great physician. I might be turning to Dynamed for answers, and that's okay, but in the context of the greater purpose of medicine and maintaining joy and resilience, I need to learn, realize that I can't really affect any change without a vital connection to the Lord. What does he say? We read in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. How much good can we affect if we're not connected to the vine? None, right? Zero. So this brings to mind a few patient encounters, and I've got some stories. We all have stories. I'm sure you could all tell stories, and we'll have a little opportunity to do that later. Um, that may serve to illustrate this reality, the disconnect, unfortunately, in the beginning. <laughs> uh, the first is a, of a college student or grad student age um, patient that came in, and she came in as I was into the resident clinic, and she was quite happy about how things were going with school. She'd recently received a diagnosis and treatment that made studying much easier for her. She had some ADHD going on, and she was super happy with the horizons that were opening up for her and her master's program that she was doing. But the challenge came when she brought up her chief complaint. Have you ever had that happen? <laughs> Something's going well until it isn't. It had to do with her heart, and unfortunately the medication she was on for her scholastic success became a problem that I needed to address. And as I continued to address the issue with her, it became apparent that although I explained clearly the rationale for why this medication could potentially be detrimental, she wasn't happy about the necessity of pausing the, the medication. And unfortunately, on top of that, on this day, I wasn't in tune to her basic need. Have you ever had that feeling of being out of sync with someone in conversation where just something's just off? With this, what this patient needed was sympathy and understanding for how the medical advice was affecting her. She, I was not in the position of putting myself in her shoes, unfortunately, and truly on that day I was disconnected. I felt it, <laughs> and she did too. But, you know, at that point I tried to do something about it. I was like, well, maybe I can salvage this. And I thought maybe just I would just pray and this whole thing would go away. But I forgot to ask that question of would prayer be helpful for you? Um, that, would have been, that would have been a good thing to ask. Um, I kind of just asked if she would like prayer. And there was the disconnect was already in place. And probably in her past experience, religion had not been helpful. And it just really blew the whole encounter even further apart. And I left feeling pretty um, discontent and unsatisfied, and the patient also um, as well. Even though I'd probably given her the right medical information, I hadn't heard her. So when I'm not connected to the vine, my ability to bring encouragement isn't there. He says, without, you, me, you, without me, you can do nothing. In this instant, it was, instance, it was clear the chasm had opened up, and it was there was just no trust left. They left feeling unheard. And reflecting on the interaction, I had to take inventory of my own thoughts and words towards the patient. Was I listening to hear or to respond? Was I connected to the vine? In this case, I have to say I wasn't, unfortunately. And it's only when we have the love of Christ in our hearts that we can truly listen. But how do we have that spiritual attunement that will allow us to tune in to our patients? How does intonation work? Going back to the title, tuning forks. What are tuning forks used for, specifically in medicine? 
Going back to physical diagnosis, what are we? Maybe some vibration sense on the hearing, hearing also hearing, yes. Hearing testing. Musicians also use tuning forks. Um, usually we tune, I'm a musician, play violin. I'm sure there's musicians here as well. We tune initially to the perfect pitch of a fork or similar instrument, maybe an oboe. In the case of violin, then there's more pitches that need to be tuned to the note that we've tuned. Um, and in the process of tuning, you can hear these beats, the, the physics of the way our auditory um, situation works, you know, as they work towards each other until they get to the interval of the perfect fifth, which has no, no, it just sounds pure once you get it. Um, it's considered a perfect interval, like I said. How many of uh, how many have sung in a choir, maybe? Yeah, many here. That's another place where intonation is very satisfying. It can be quite disquieting to have a voice that's singing just a little bit off, and you can, it just, it just ruins the experience to a certain extent. How much of our lack of resilience and satisfaction in our practice comes from a lack of attunement with God and subsequently with our patients in a similar way? I left that encounter with a pit in my stomach because I knew that that had not been in tune with the patient. I have another story that highlights this condition. I'm not proud to rehearse these interactions, but they serve as valuable lessons to me in terms of keeping my focus on Christ and remaining dependent on him in my interactions. And it all goes, these, these interactions, it always helps to not assume the context of whoever's coming in to, to a patient interaction. So on this particular day, I had a patient coming in for a procedure to have her toenail removed. And I was somewhat stressed already because my supervising physician had been running, had run late and we were behind. And you know, the schedule pressures. Because anybody relate to those? <laughs> Running behind in clinic and, yeah. Um, this is life, and it's especially the life of a resident. But as I'm engaged with the patient and walking them through the consent process for the procedure, I had the, this nagging thought that this patient might not want the procedure or that something was going to go wrong. Do you ever get those really anxious patients and you're just like, uh, you know, I can't seem to calm them down. They had a greater amount of anxiety or questions relating to the procedure, and the anxiety was kind of palpable in the room. So I offered them a medication alternative to the treatment, but they seemed to desire to proceed, um, and that they had more questions. So after a particularly detailed question, I just was kind of stressed, and I felt like I didn't have a good answer, and I press, prefaced my, you know, I regret to say unfeeling answer by saying, well, I'm not a prophet. <laughs> And for whatever reason, those are not the words in any other context that's fine, you know, to say to your friends. But for her, that um, didn't relate to her situation, and she felt unheard. Um, my concerns were put, I put them ahead of the patient. That was the problem again. And our interaction broke down. My very thoughtful Christian MA made sure I knew <laughs> afterwards. She said, Dr. Guthrie, you have to read the room. And <laughs> while still being very understanding of the situation and saying, you know, you didn't really say anything that bad. It just wasn't, wasn't the right way to go. But how often do I stand in the way of what God is trying to do? How often are my attempts to meet a need founded in my own desire to fill my needs or protect myself from inconvenience and stress? I'm feeling this stress. The schedule's running behind. The attending is exact, exacting, maybe, or I can't measure up to their expectations. So... What, where's my dependence? But the more I try and fix these things on my own or focus on the flow of my day, the more stress I seem to encounter. It's kind of this spiral that goes, goes that way. We recently had a Bible study with some residents um, on Psalm 23. And that chapter opens with the words, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And through, the, through our discussion in that Bible study, I had the impression that God wants us to experience more of his supply, I shall not want. And again, in Philippians 4.19, we read, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So when something goes sideways in a patient interaction due to me putting my needs ahead of the patient, it is really just an opportunity to again seek the Lord for his supply. 
If I'm wanting something, needing something, it's a sign that I need to seek the Lord and how willing he is to impart his grace and wisdom in our time of need. We don't need to have our day run a certain way to make the right impression on our patient or supervisor. All our needs are met in him. So then, is a solution to pray for the answers to our challenges as they arise throughout the day? I would beg to differ on this. It's not wrong to pray throughout the day. But in the context of my first patient, it doesn't always work to try to plug in after the fact, right? I tried to bring prayer in and it just didn't work. Sometimes the damage is already done and the trust is broken down. In light of our theory that burnout is not so much of a problem that needs a solution as it is a dilemma that needs in need of sustainable processes, I believe we need to rethink the way we approach our prayers also. We really need, what we really need is the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And this has been impressed on me through multiple avenues recently. All of, God gifts, of God's gifts for man are wrapped up in this one gift of the Holy Spirit. We, re, um, we read in Ye Shall Receive Power, devotional by Ellen White, Only those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings how many blessings in its train? All other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. Amen? Amen. When Christ left his disciples, what did he say in John 16, verse 13? He says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11 says, these are the things God has revealed to us by a spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So if we want to know the thoughts of God, how do we do that? Through the Holy Spirit. And we need that sense of his presence there with us. What God, does, what God desires more than anything is that we would seek him above everything else. Above solutions to our immediate problems. Above our late schedule. Above our difficult patients. I put difficult patients. <laughs> Sometimes the difficulty is with us, right? I've recently been reading the, that book by, or started reading the book by Pavel Goya, the one mentioned this morning, The Spirit and Power, and I, too, recommend the book. Um, and we had the privilege of having Pavel in Loma Linda last fall for the week of prayer, and he mentioned, he told the story that he writes of in the first chapter of that book. Um, and that chapter highlights the story. It really illustrates the principle of elevating our desire for God above our desire for his gifts or solutions to our media problems. So during his time in school in Michigan, he and his family were facing a lot of life challenges, from food to housing to education. They all seemed to be falling apart at once. But what impressed me in the story was how quickly everything changed. It wasn't immediate, but throughout the process of waiting, he became impressed to pray not so much for solutions to the impending loss of housing, food, and education, but the solutions came when they stopped praying for an outcome and started seeking the Lord for who he is seeking his plan above all else. Suddenly, all their problems were resolved, and for those who've read it, by miraculous intervention and dramatic, in dramatic abundance in place of their need. Um, but you have to read the book to get the rest of the story. How often are we too focused on a specific problem or thing that we think we need, that we miss the greater purpose that God desires for us? We miss a connection with a patient or opportunity to meet the need of that patient. Well, thankfully, this is possible and results in the most rewarding experiences we could hope for. Thank the Lord he does this. There's another story I want to share. This time, I had a medical student with me in clinic. This is also in residency. He was great, this medical student. He had lots of energy and enthusiasm for seeing patients. And on this particular patient, we were following up on a recent procedure that they had completed. And they were there with their spouse in the visit. But upon further gathering of history, it was evident that their visit seemed 
to be redundant. They had another visit with the specialist that afternoon to follow up on the same issue. And I don't know, the schedulers sometimes do that, right? And you just get a blessing. Those are great visits for, and the residents, as residents, were always happy for them. But in the course of the visit, they mentioned they would be heading out of town for the weekend. And I just imp felt impressed in that moment to probe a little deeper. And it turns out they'd experienced a tragic loss of a close family member and were traveling for the funeral that weekend. That wasn't on their chief complaint when they came in. But this opened up the door, and we prayed together. And they, they had tears in their eyes. That was evidence that this interaction was an opportunity where the great physician had come in, and he was doing his healing work for them. But we weren't done. Every patient in our clinic had to be staffed with an attending. As we discussed the case, the attending said something like, this patient didn't even need to come in. We didn't argue, but I took the opportunity to highlight the way God desires to work in our practice with the medical student. He was so happy and agreed. He said that this was why he came into medicine, and this was what he wanted to do moving forward. God took a useless visit and ministered to the patient and inspired the medical student, and the only difference was the connection the attunement to that impression of the Holy Spirit, to ask what the deeper issue was. Another patient came in more recently, where the last patient really didn't need to be there for any medical reason, but had a spiritual need. This patient came in with a problem that was beyond my ability to help. Do you ever get those patients? <laughs> you feel like you're just kind of out of your depth. They had multiple sclerosis, um, but in this case, in this pa particular patient, it progressed to the point where it was hard for the patient to swallow, and he'd recently had a PEG tube placed. And he was coming into the outpatient clinic after the procedure with intense pain. Given all the medications he was on, though, Dilaudid and all of the others, there wasn't really anything I could add to his pain regimen, and I simply recommended that he return to be evaluated for potential complications with his tube, with interventional radiology. But something about the overwhelming nature of his pain and condition struck me. Just, he seemed weighed down and at, at his wit's end. And the impression came that I needed to pray with him. He shared how his illness had progressed and of the challenges he was facing at, faced with at each step. And when I finally took the opportunity to pray with him, a flood of emotion was released and tears just flowed. His physical pain was real, but the deeper pain he faced was the pain of carrying his disease. How many of us can relate to that? We all carry the disease, don't we, of sin. But when disease is present, where do we turn? We might call disease a lack of attunement in our body. Could we say that? <laughs> Something is off, and we experience dis-ease. It makes us uneasy. I've become more aware of this uneasiness and found it frequently palpable in my patients. We talked about that. You all have seen those patients before kind of like that patient I was consenting for the procedure. They exude an anxiety or angst surrounding their condition. But when we are connected to the vine, this provides the greatest opportunity because for God, a need is an opening for him to work. In the case of the patient with dysphagia, he left so encouraged and hopeful. And I was able to give him a piece of literature focused on finding peace. Through attunement, God had been able to meet his need and the greatest satisfaction came to me and to him. That was a, a reality that wouldn't have been present in any, other, in any other context. And this is the true joy of practice that breeds resilience. Our job is simply to bring the need in contact with the source of all power and strength. And that abiding presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit is how that is to happen. How is the world to know that we are his disciples? John 17, verse 22 and 23 says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. When we are one in him, when he abides in us through the Holy Spirit, that's how we experience this. How are we to have that happen, though? How are we to receive that experience? Have you ever had the item that you just can't seem to find? Your keys, 
whatever it was. You've lost it, and you've turned the room upside down. Then finally, when you aren't looking for it anymore, you give up. And then finally, when you've stopped, it just shows up. <laughs> I think sometimes this is just because we were looking in the wrong direction. And the same can be true spiritually. Sometimes we become myopic on our problems. We're looking in the wrong direction. We aren't seeking God alone for who he is and to experience him and his abiding presence. But it could also be that we, need, we feel like we need to pass a certain threshold before God can answer, that we haven't sought him enough. Have you ever felt that way? That you just need to do some more? But we could ask the question, are God's gifts dependent on us? No. What does the word of God say we are to do? John 6.29 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. John 6, verse 29. He further elaborates on how he is the living bread. As we partake of him, we experience more and more of his fullness. But that begs the question, if our work is to believe, what are we to believe? Is that a good question to ask? The Apostle Paul puts it this way, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Colossians 2 verse 10 says, you are complete in him. I think that's what we need to believe. Because if we don't believe that, then what do we start doing? We start looking other places. We start stressing. We start having anxiety. And we, our, our attunement leaves us. And how is this true? Well, 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says, according to his divine power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So how does this change our way of practicing medicine? Well, I just want to take a few minutes, as I mentioned at the beginning, and to pause here. And with your row or whoever you're with, just take an opportunity to share some stories that you have noticed, where you've noticed either a lack of attunement and, and a lesson you can bring from that, or to highlight a testimony of how you felt God has worked in an interaction. I think it's always beneficial when we share stories together. And then we'll come back. Um, I'll give us, let's see what time, what time are we looking at here. Let's take five minutes, um, and, then, and then we'll come back. So gather with the people in your, in your row and, and maybe share a story of how, what's been a challenge or where you felt like attunement has been present and a lesson you can learn from that. So how many of you all were encouraged by what you heard in your groups? Yeah? I wish I could have heard all the stories, but the stories that I did hear were very encouraging. I think that's what these conferences are really good for, to inspire each other and encourage each other in the Lord. Amen? And these stories bring to us the contrasting experience between being in tune or out of tune. We should ask ourselves, what do we have? Dissonance or harmony? Do we have a scarcity or abundance mindset? We have the blessings of the universe wrapped up in the one gift of Jesus Christ, and he's been given to our world. Not just to those who believe, but our belief makes all those blessings able to flow. It's like that dam that breaks in those patient encounters, and then just you see the way forward. The dam that holds them back is our unbelief so frequently. Do we want disease, dis-ease, or salvation, healing? Detachment or attunement? When we have the positive working of the Holy Spirit in our lives and a ministry to our patients, we can experience the blessings of Isaiah 58, verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy, thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Is there a story of people who tried to heal their, on their own in the Bible? Can we think of that? How did that work out? And what was the solution to their problem? We can go there, and if you want to, you can turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. This is the story of the disciples when he sent them out. So when the disciples had come, Mark 9, verse 14, he saw a great multitude and, about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. 
And he asked the scribes, what question you with them? And one of the people, multitude, answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wherever he takes him, he teareth him down, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, wallowing and foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came into him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was one de- as one dead, insomuch that many had said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, and this is what I wanted to focus on, why could we not cast him out? Isn't that a good question? Do you ever feel that way, like in a patient interaction? What went wrong, Lord? Why couldn't I, why couldn't I make that go right? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. What is the key? Prayer. Prayer. A vital connection. What is the solution for us? We talked about it before. We need to seek God for who he is. This alone can allow him to work in our lives and in the lives of our patients. We need to believe that what he has said about his abundant provision for us is true, and in believing that, we can experience it. And not for our, just for ourselves only, but for our patients. My challenge for you is to pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for attunement, and in doing so, you will find the source of strength and resilience, always ready to impart his healing and joy. So in closing, I just wanted to tell a story about a patient. Let's call him Joe. I just saw him a couple weeks ago. He's a young Hispanic man in his mid to late 30s. And for being such a young man, he's lived a lot of life already. He has several children that are already in their late teens or early 20s, but you wouldn't know it looking at him. He looks like he's in his 20s. Very cheerful, very happy guy. And this man, he came into the clinic the other day to establish care. Right off the bat, I noticed something was different about him. And it was one of those appointments, I'm getting ramped up to my new patient load and I have time. And I believe the Lord also opens time in our schedules. Um, And he opened time for this, this man because as he was coming to establish care, um, our conversation kind of you know, covered a few of the basic medical history components that we needed to, but then we just got to talking, and I told him that I was driving up from you know, the valley into the high desert, and he mentioned that he'd been doing a job that was opposite, down in the valley, in construction. And so he'd done, been doing this job. He'd hired a couple guys. Um, well, he'd been doing a job, and then across the street, there was a pastor that had a house. And as he saw what he was doing on the job, he, the pastor thought, well, I, I want this guy to come work for me. So Joe, he talked to the pastor and agreed, but he told him, look, I don't have a contractor's license. You need to know that up front. This is, this is all, you know, I have to be up front with you. And it's going to take me a couple weeks, and, and here's the price. Well, he hired a couple guys to work with him, and they got to work on the project, and a week goes by, two weeks, three weeks, however long it took, and then they finished the job, and he called the pastor out, looked at the job, everything was fine, but the pastor said, wait, you're, are you licensed? And he said, no, we were clear about this up front, you know, I can't, I, you know, I did the job, and we agreed, you know, and I need the money to pay my, the guys I've hired to work for me, and the pastor, very sad, but the pastor was like, I can only, I'm only giving you $1,000, you know, and the job was, you know, four times, five times that much. Um, but you know what I really admired about this guy was he had gone through so much in his life. He had a, he told me about the criminal record that he had. He'd been falsely accused of murder 
and he was in prison for six months. And when he came to the end of that, he was just praying. He prayed to the Lord. He said, Lord, I, I didn't do this. You know I didn't do this. Um, and he told the DA, you know, this person who's accusing me of this, they're never going to show up for you, you know. Like, can we make a deal? And, you know, what are you expecting when you're going to maybe for this, he would have gotten 30 years, de- decades of his life in prison. Um, and he gets called in that day, and the, they say, we'll make you a deal, S- three years of probation. And he just w- was overjoyed. The Lord really, he felt like God had really answered his prayer in that situation. And on top of that, he gave him, he'd heard bad things, you know, it's like those patients, you hear bad things, you're like, hey, look out for this one, good luck in there, Doc, you know. Um, he had that with the parole officer. The parole officer was known for her, but the Lord gave him favor in the eyes of the parole officer, and after six months, he was, he was free. But after this experience in construction and trying to find so many other jobs and being turned away so many times, it's easy to become discouraged. But this patient just really inspired me. Despite, of all, his, despite all of his challenges that he was facing, he still expressed his faith in the Lord, and he, it, he, didn't let him get it, he didn't let any of those things get him down. And he mentioned that as a kid, he'd always looked at truck drivers, and he's like, I think I'd like to do that someday. But having kids for so many years and all these things and people to take care of, he hadn't had the flexibility or freedom to do that. But as he's leaving construction now, he's made that decision. He's like, I'm done with this, you know, <laughs> I can't do this anymore. He, the Lord has just, he told me, God opened this up, and somebody is going to pay my way to go to trucking school. And, and I, that's why I'm here. I'm, I, I just had my physical, and I just am trying to get plugged back in. And just such an encouragement. Um, no matter the challenges we face, that God is there for us. And I was just blown away by his response. How many of us, you know, we fi- face these challenges in our clinic? What was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. (laughs) My mom reminded me of the very important point. The first thing that this guy wanted to do when he got his trucking job is he's going to pay back those guys that work for him. Um, I mean, it's just easy enough to be like, well, I didn't get the money. None of us get the money, you know, like, but he's he's a a true, honest seeker after God, and we connected on that. Um, And truly, when we trust in God, he can meet all of our needs. Right? His abundance is more than we could imagine. And it doesn't matter what's in our past. If we have the worst criminal record and nobody will take us, it seeming, seemingly take us for a job, this patient, he received that job. And it was just amazing to see how God worked for him. Um, I remember attending one of the first Amen conferences in San Diego. I don't remember how many years ago. We were just talking about it yesterday. And there was a speaker who made an appeal um, to start a media ministry. And I remember seeing all these people go up and throw their name tags on the, on the stage. And that represented a pledge of $10,000 towards this ministry that didn't yet exist. And that, I, I particularly remember several residents at that time taking their name tags up there. And I don't think either of those residents that came to my mind are here. Well, maybe there are some. <laughs> and as a young person, that made a huge impression on me. Um, thinking of these people who are carrying debt and they're pledging $10,000, you know, what, what are we willing to risk for God? Um, there's a greater debt that's been paid for us, and we owe everything in response to the outpouring of all heaven for us. Um, I think an appeal was made for that this morning in, in, in Dr. An's talk, um, and that was inspiring to me. All the gifts we spoke of, the reality that we are complete in him, all of that came at infinite cost, and we owe it all to Christ. So my question today is, how many of there are you here who would like to join me in saying, I want to seek Christ for who he is, and not just as a solution to my problems as they arise? How many of you all would like to say that? We desperately need the eye salve of the Holy Spirit, as we heard last night in our practice. Otherwise, we're walking blind. <laughs> We're walking blind to the needs of those around us and to our own condition. Let's seek the Lord and pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He is so willing to give us this gift, and it is truly the gift that brings all other blessings in its train, as we read. So, coming back full circle, what is the answer, the true answer to resilience and joy, the antidote to burnout? I believe the Bible gives us the answer 
and Galatians. All of those blessings are listed, right? Don't you want to experience lasting love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, or self-control in your practice, in your life? If that's your desire, I invite you to stand with me as we close in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for your presence, the promise of your presence through the Holy Spirit, and for the infinite sacrifice of Christ, whose whose life here has provided full provision for every person on this world, all of our patients, and for us to experience the joy, the resilience, the joy that you so desire for us. We truly pray that your joy, the joy of the Lord, would be our strength, and that through seeking you for who you are, for your character, for your love, that we would come to understand in our lives the true sustaining joy of resilience, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray that for each one here, and pray that you'd bless us for the rest of this conference. We owe it all to you, in Jesus' name, amen.